Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of React Roundup. My name is TJ Van Toll, and with me on a panel today is Paige Nijunas. Hey, everyone. And our special guest today is Miroslav Nikolov, which hopefully I, I pronounced that correctly. But Miroslav, welcome to React Roundup. Why don't you tell everybody who you are, what you do, why you're famous, that sort of stuff. Uh, thank you. Hi, everybody. I don't think I'm famous, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I work as a UI developer, mostly frontends, so one.com. It's a Danish company that is currently expanding. And um, what I do is basically React. And in my free time, I try to uh, maintain my blog. So turning my experience in some useful articles, that's like something like a hobby. And yeah, I'm a family guy. I have uh, my wife and a kid, a boy. So that basically takes all, our, all, all my free time. So <laughs> I don't really have much time to spend on uh, side activities. That's still fun. We were talking before, I'm very jealous. Um, Denmark, Copenhagen is a super beautiful area. So I'm very jealous of that. And your blog, we'll, we'll drop it in the, the show notes as well. I like the design on it as well. And I know like I, reading through some of them, I know you wanted to talk a bit about testing and writing just human, what you call human friendly React component tests. Do you want to outline sort of that whole concept and what you mean by that to sort of kick us off here? Did you work your tail off to get that senior developer gig just to realize that senior dev doesn't actually mean dream job? I've been there too. My first senior developer job was at a place where all of our triumphs were the bosses and all the failures were ours. The second one was a great place to continue to learn and grow, only for it to go under due to poor management. And now I get job offers from great places to work all the time. Not only that, but the last job interview I actually sat in was a discussion about how much my podcast had helped the people interviewing me. If you're looking for a way to get into your dream job, then join our Dev Heroes Accelerator. Not only will we help you get the kind of exposure that makes you attractive to your dream employer, but you'll be able to ask them for top dollar as well. Check it out at devheroesaccelerator.com. Yeah, it's, it's basically, um, it's all about a library called Unexpected JS, And it's, I know it's not very popular, but what it does on what it adds on top of everything else we we have seen is actually a lot of plain english when you when you write your tests and i'm using that library basically for the past 5 years and i just decided to write an article which which is just a short introduction to what is possible with the library and so i decided to write the article for css tricks so that it's it's basically rich a little bit wider audience. And uh, it was very surprising that I think right now, if you write React component tests or just React tests, testing, that appears on, a, on the first page. And But I believe this is because of the strong domain of CSS tricks. So yeah, it's, it's also brought some discussion uh, because it seems like people prefer a different style of testing and uh, it's a little bit opinionated. But yeah, there are some, there is some positive feedback as well. So can you expand a little bit about, about what unexpected JS is? Because that's actually a framework that I've never heard of before. But I'm, I'm interested, does it work like with React testing library or is it Cypress or is it both unit and end to end? Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, first, just to say that I'm not a maintainer of the library. I'm I'm using it. But as far as I know, it should be able, because it works with plugins, it should be able to use some of the plugins with React Testing Library. So you can use React Testing Library and some assertions, custom assertions on top, so you can write your plain English tests. And uh, behind that, it's React Testing Library. So it's uh, it, should, it should be possible, though I haven't tried. Yeah, and uh, I also have a light version of the article on my blog. Just it's a little bit lighter without the introduction because currently it's a little bit controversial on how, on how we test. And I know the community is going strongly after React Testing Library, so people are sometimes picky when you you present something unusual or you. Absolutely. New um, things are not to be trusted. <laughs> React developers don't have opinions. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so 
So how did you first come across Unexpected? You said you've been using it for a number of years now. Did it somebody else introduce it to you or was it just something you stumbled upon and you really liked how it, how it operated? Uh, to be honest, I didn't have choice because uh, when I joined one.com, uh, they they have already they already using have already using this library, and uh, some of the people who are maintaining the library um, also work for the company at some point, though they are no longer part. But we still we are still using it uh, internally. So that's yeah, as good a reason as any. Reason. Yeah. <laughs> Could you get a little bit into, I know one thing you cover in your article is trying to write tests that are sort of, well, you say he, human friendly or easily readable. Could you give like some examples of what you mean by that? And I know like <laughs> syntax is kind of hard on a, on a on an audio podcast, but just like high level, like how you approach structuring tests in a, in a human friendly or in a more readable way. Yeah, so basically what we use is the usual arrange, act, assert kind of thing, which is, I mean, you first arrange your test, then you act on it, and then you assert. So this is basically a shared approach for, I think, for every testing library. But what uh, Unexpected does a little bit different is the, the expect assertion. It's just a function expect, and inside you pass as many arguments as you want, and these arguments are are just plain strings, so you don't really have a jQuery like uh, syntax like dot not dot equals or dot to be executed. It's just plain English, and usually the editor is colors that in uh, the same color, so it's very easy to read. It's easy for the eye. Maybe not so straightforward to write it because your editor won't help you to auto complete different function calls. But it's uh, it's it's really yeah, it's, it's really easy for the AI, and we we are working in a in a team, and it's basically usually not just one person who is working with these uh, file testing files. So you want something um, expressive there. This is very cool. I'm I'm looking at the article right now. I guess one question I have is how how long do you think it takes a new developer to get up to speed with using something like unexpected? Like most of us, if we've been working with React for a while, we're probably pretty familiar with Jest, maybe familiar with Enzyme, maybe familiar with React testing library, but how easy or difficult do you think it is to to get up to speed with unexpected and then start to potentially integrate it into your any existing testing frameworks that you might have? I think it's it's pretty easy, especially if you use examples as uh, real examples as a reference. Maybe documentation is not going to be the fastest uh, path, uh, learning path, but if you use examples, it's it's really easy. And usually, you have just you have several common assertions that you would like to to use, and uh, you don't really use so many uh, different features. At least for the, the React components, you want to test if something has uh, rendered. So usually you test, uh, you query for an element and you, you test for its string that it contains. Mm -hmm. And also the other thing is testing uh, function calls. That is also straightforward. So apart from these two things, presence of certain elements and uh, executing functions, you most likely rarely going to use other other like assertions, I would say. Yeah, but it, it's very it's very straightforward. At least for at least for me, it was as I remember. That's always encouraging. It's it, I remember when I was first learning React testing library, it was a kind of a massive mind shift for me to go from the way that Jest and Enzyme had been doing it to trying to reorient myself towards the way React testing library focuses on what's in the DOM and interacting with that at a, at a unit test level. So anything that is easier to get up and started with is definitely always good. <laughs> yeah, that's still yeah. something is like, I'm not as in the weeds with unit testing libraries anymore. So sometimes a lot of this type of stuff goes over my head. And I, I'm actually curious, like and this, this is a question, I guess, for, for both of you is, where is the React world at right now for in terms of like testing markup structure 
in your like individual unit tests? Because I know Miroslav, in some of your articles, you went in and you were like basically asserting against the exact DOM structure. Is there some advantages to that or like versus like if I'm if I want to test that my component renders something specifically, like how specific should your assertion be for I'm looking for this exact markup structure or do you just like try to pick out an individual string? Like I just care that it spit this out correctly. Like I'm kind of curious where the React world is at with with that sort of setup right now. So from my understanding and what my team is doing today is that we're a lot more focused on the same, basically the same interactions that you would try and do in an end-to-end test in the unit tests. So it's a lot less about did this Redux dispatch happen or did this particular function mock get called? And it's a lot more of can I see this element in the DOM? Can I click this button or is this button disabled? Did this list appear and can I interact with it? Which like I said, it's a little bit hard to get used to when you're coming from the old way of testing, did this function fire? But I I like it a lot more because it seems to me to be a lot more true to life and how as how a user would interact with our application. They don't care if the Redux dispatch fired or not. They just care that they're list loaded and you know they can click the button and go through their shopping cart. So that's kind of what we've been leaning towards. So not necessarily you know, is there this particular H1 tag with this ID, but can I see, you know, my page title or can I see this drawer that is supposed to be there at the bottom and can I open it or can I click buttons and, you know, do different stuff like that within the component. So that's kind of the approach that we're taking, but I'd love to hear how other people are doing it as well. I would say that we're using the same approach, at least uh, comparing the DOM structure is something that we use rarely. And I know that the community is pretty much with React testing library going away from that kind of assertions. So we use it rarely and we mostly unit test and we have strong QA team. So the visual part is really for them. So it's not something that we really deal with. It's um, we focus on the unit tests and edge cases, especially. So yeah. that, that's our way. That makes a lot of sense. And because I remember like you said, page, the way it used to be is you would, you would do things like ensure your mocks were hit or that your, your testing structure, but it felt like a lot of times you were just writing those tests to write those tests so that you get like better code coverage and such. I like that just because it feels like it, I don't know, the test just makes more sense. And I feel like there's a lot better, not just QA, but like visual testing tools now as well to catch some of these things like I, I think a lot of these like snapshotting tools are becoming a lot more popular as well to catch like if you did screw up some like markup thing and your buttons suddenly doesn't look like a button anymore that there's some other test is going to catch that so you don't need to t- like test your html parsing yeah and actually that's something that i'd be interested to hear more about miroslav you said that you've got a qa team who helps you with the visual portion of it are they using, that you're aware of, are they using any particular tools? Because visual regression testing is something that my team has struggled with in the past, but we haven't really found a great tool that helps keep that up to date. Yeah, they, they have their own tools, but a lot of the testing is, I think, kind of end-to-end testing. For example, adding a product to the shopping cart and we follow the whole process up until the end. This is uh, what is important for for them some i know some people suggest to write user stories as the part of the storybook and then you use something like cypress on top to visually compare uh, your user stories your components i haven't tried that i think it at least for our case it's going to be too much of an effort if you really do your homework with the unit tests at least our experience shows that we don't really face production bugs and we are not really trying to have a full test coverage just trying to test the fragile parts of our applications so but actually we have a we have a product which was launched in uh, somewhere october it's heavily used and we didn't have uh, a single front end bug for that product up until this moment 
it was, I think the team did a good job on testing and uh, iterations. So it's, I know it's rare to yeah, hear something impressive. like that. But that's it's, remarkable. Uh, it's happens <laughs> from time to time. Did you get an award? <laughs> like, <is> it... <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not sure if people notice that uh, achievement. They don't uh, notice until it stops working. That's the problem. Yeah. yeah. True. That's the thing about testing is like there's you don't get a if you do your job right like no one ever knows that you have all these processes behind it. It's sort of the good and bad thing about it. So I'm curious, yeah. Miroslav, what what made you want to write about this and start a blog and share some of this stuff? Yeah, I didn't do it before because I I suppose the our time is uh, such a resource that we basically it's not a, we we cannot regain it one it's lost basically so writing an article i mean junior developers writing an article is something that uh, at least i try to avoid because i don't think i i had something to tell to, something valuable to take tell people and reading my 10 minutes uh, article will be a um, loss of time so I decided to start writing maybe after 13 years of working in, with web applications just because I, I feel a little bit more comfortable and maybe I have something important to say and people won't just spend their 10 minutes and forget after that. It's a, it's a, it's a tricky area. At least I, I feel uncomfortable. So yeah, that's the main reason, I suppose. And I have a lot of ideas and material during these years so there's plenty of topics i think after 13 years you could be considered kind of an expert in development that's that's a fair amount of time to see a lot of stuff <laughs> yeah yeah Even get that. explorer 6 <laughs> it was there back back then i remember but yeah 13 years is about where i'm at as well i started my first apps were IE6 only corporate apps. So this is yeah. these are fun times. <laughs> yeah. So I you see can... here. Oh, go ahead. Please go ahead. Oh, no. I just wanted to say that uh, writing an article about Internet Explorer 6 is probably, I don't know, it's not going to be very famous. So. I don't know. It's about time for like the nostalgia of that to, to kick in because now, now you can tell them it's like war stories, right? Like back in the day. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, today people are starting uh, with React directly. I mean, they, they don't even uh, learn JavaScript. Uh, for them, JavaScript is uh, now it's something like React. And five, six years ago, it was maybe jQuery. Mm -hmm. So jQuery, yeah, think, Angular. I think like, and we're talking about testing too. The, the thing that amazes me nowadays is for the most part, when you write your code, you don't have to worry too much about your code just straight up not working in other browsers, which like sometimes sometimes you do catch little things. Like it's 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 the sort of thing where you, you still do kind of need to test your code in other browsers, but for the most part, you kind of don't anymore. It, like especially in desktop browsers, like chances are the code you write is going to work. And that's still like quite the mind shift from how it used to be where it used to be you wrote your code and like you opened your you just prayed before you opened all the other five or six browsers you needed things to work in that's true i to be honest i don't think i go out of uh, chrome and I, I don't really test on other browsers yeah and you're right because even qa they are, they don't they don't find they don't find sparks often in other browsers so it's things things are working have you ever wondered if you could be offering a faster, less buggy experience for your customers? I mean, let's face it, the only way you're going to know that is by actually running it on production. So go figure it out, right? You run it on production, but you need something plugged in so that you can find out where those issues are, where it's slowing down, where it's having bugs. You just you need something like that there. And Raygun is awesome at this. They, they just added the performance monitoring, which is really slick, and it works like a breeze. I, I just, I love it. I love it. It's like, it's like you get the ray gun and you zap the bugs. It's anyway, definitely go check it out. It's going to save you a ton of time, a ton of money, a ton of sanity. I mean, let, let's face it, grepping through logs is no fun. And having people not able to tell you that it's too slow because they got sidetracked into Twitter is also not fun. 
So go check out Raygun. They are definitely going to help you out. There are thousands of customer-centric, customer-focused software companies who use Raygun every day to deliver great experiences for their customers. And if you go to Raygun and you use our link, you can get a 14-day free trial. So you can go check that out at reactroundup.com slash Raygun. So one question that I had is when I visit your website, the first thing I see is that you were previously a CEO and a CTO. So how did you go from being in charge of whole companies and whole divisions to back to a developer? Did you want to be less of a manager and more of a team, like an individual contributor or how did, how did that happen? Yeah, it's, uh, I think it happened naturally. <laughs> Again, it's it was a small company where I was basically, um, maybe I was a CEO, actually. I was doing everything because the owner was uh, were in uh, basically in Sweden and I, I was back in Bulgaria at that time. So I was managing the whole business plus the development for the company, but it was a relatively small one. So it's, it's easy to manage and to have many responsibilities, even accounting and things like that. But at that point, I also started freelancing. So I I was freelancing a little bit, then moved away from that company. And then I met my wife here in Copenhagen. It was related to one of our uh, freelance projects. And Copenhagen is, I mean, it's a really expensive city compared to Europe. It's probably the most expensive one. And you really need a full-time job to survive here. So this is how I ended up in the company is web developer yeah wow so basically running a company wasn't enough for you you had to do freelance work on the side too <laughs> that's dedication <laughs> yes at some point it became too much uh, but yeah you can do it for some time before you burn out yeah so looking at the blog is your blog built with gatsby what, what did you use to create this yeah it's exactly gatsby js and i was I was inspired by uh, Dan Abramov's blog. It uses the starter team. So it's uh, really just the starter team, starter team with some, um, some tweaks. So I just wanted something simple, up and running fast. And after that, maybe I will figure out a better design for it. But for now, it's just, it just works. It looks I really like good. The, uh, yeah, I like the just the clean look of it and the fact that you have dark mode <laughs> yeah it's it's a default thing now right it is. everybody so yeah. and i also see you have a, a newsletter as well so. yeah it's i'm trying to keep up with it it's once a month and i'm uh, i'm trying to send i'm usually sending uh, my art new article which is at least i have time for one article per month i can't really write more often it's difficult with family and one article per month and some interesting thoughts and links maybe I, I have found. But at least I'm, I'm trying to write about the topics that you... It was difficult to find a quick solution in, in, by just Googling. So if I can't really find a solution, I, I, would, I would write about it. And I remember it was uh, an article about something like a tutorial on how to create a, a sticky table header but with react but by using just uh, a normal table not a, a diff based uh, flex or flexbox based layouts and uh, it was surprising for, to me that actually there are not so many examples that you can find and this article is without any seo is now it's it's pretty high when you try to look for something like that in google yeah. it's newsletter so Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just noticed because actually I clicked on that article in particular. I noticed that you have unique reads, and I was wondering how you did that because that's a really cool little feature to have. Wait, I don't think I know what unique reads are. Yeah, it's it's not Google Analytics because uh, it's so not straightforward to implement that thing in in your blog. And it's oh, I just it's saw a, I just saw it. Okay. Yeah. You mean like. I, I see it now. So yeah, this is in case anybody else here listening to this totally didn't understand it either. He has on each blog post, the number of unique people that have viewed an individual blog post. And that is 
definitely interesting. I don't think I've ever seen anybody just like sometimes you see views, but I don't think I've ever seen anybody list unique readers. Yeah, I, I, it was reads, but then I found many blogs which are just counting the the visitors. So they have, mm-hmm. yeah. for example, they display uh, sixty thousand views, but that doesn't really make sense because I can reload my browser two hundred times, and then it's not really useful. And I'm using a third party service that is just a counter, and whenever your component renders, I just put in use effect a call to this service so it will count, but in the same time return back the number of unique reads. So this is the way how it's it's uh, done. It's very simple. Yeah, it sounds like it might be worth a blog post. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's one of these topics that are not very well covered. If you try to search how to add a counter in Gatsby blog, it's it's all about Google Analytics, and it's so so difficult to do it. <laughs> it's funny though how little things like that people can find useful. One of my the most popular things I've ever written is I wrote like my blog is a little bit older. So it's written with Jekyll and I've, I came up with some way, like it's like a one liner piece of code to have a Jekyll like point to an external blog post. So if you wanted to list blog posts, but include things that you wrote on like other places and that thing gets like, I, I don't know what, but it's it, it's like a two paragraph blog post and I, it gets like, it hit a sweet spot in Google. So it's funny how sometimes these things that you think are really little can be actually super valuable to people. Yeah, it's it's true. I With today's uh, situation, I mean, you can really easily create a serverless kind of service. And because it's so easy and people don't really need to have a local database or to own the database, yeah. They usually use something like Firebase and try to easily uh, put together some third-party services and voila, it works. But it's it's not really, I mean, so much effort for, for such a simple job. It's At least I, I try to think about the simplest possible solution out there. So, yeah. I like it. I, I feel like the it's funny because personal blogs are the one place where over-engineering something is like not only okay, but sometimes almost encouraged, right? Because it's like a place that you can experiment and have some fun with yeah it's it's uh, especially when you are just starting you can do a lot of experiments i'm doing that a lot because i I don't really have so many um, readers so it's 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 yeah it's now is the time to do crazy things Uh, (laughs) when you get a lot of readers then you're they came for the crazy things so then you got to keep doing it (laughs) yeah they can even see a 404 (laughs) yeah (laughs) The, uh, so how... Go ahead, Paige. We keep doing this. Oh, no. Please continue. <laughs> the other thing I'm wondering about, speaking of like little implementation details, what are you using to implement the newsletter? Yeah, it's uh, MailChimp for now. They, I think they, they give 1,000, I think, subscribers for free. So it's, yeah, it's pretty safe or a choice for me, but I may change it in the future. And do they give you the little, like you have this little section in your blog post that encourages people to join? Is that something they provided or did you code up the design for that yourself? Do you mean the pop-up? The little or... thing that says join a front end newsletter, like the little thing that entices people to subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, the form on, on the bottom. If, yeah. yeah. The form on the bottom is just uh, custom made. It's uh, not really MailChimp. I, I just uh, post to their service. So it registered the email address and then I just uh, display a confirm message. But it, it's not um, it's not MailChimp. You've got a little bit of design talent because that thing looks really nice. It's I very was, cute. I, in, I like it a lot. I was impressed. I know you said you're using like the default uh, theme and such, but I can tell you've tweaked this quite a bit. It looks really nice. <laughs> I'm, je- I'm jealous and I might steal this. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's an evolution. <laughs> <laughs> are you d- hosting a newsletter on your on your website tj no th- no newsletter but we do stuff for like kind of react and progress sometimes and you can definitely take some inspiration from this <laughs> yeah i implemented one on my own personal website which i launched uh about a month ago when we're recording this anyway um but i ch- and i looked at all 
the different email providers like MailChimp and Mailgun and ConvertKit. I think. Also. Yeah, ConvertKit is a big one. I ended up going with one called Substack though, and oh. the thinking was that Substack doesn't charge you based on the amount of readers you have. It actually charges you if you start to monetize your newsletter because my blog is exactly what yours is. It's just a personal one. I write tech articles, I post them. And if people want to get notified when I do, great. But I don't really see it ever becoming some sort of a monetized thing. And I, even though I'm very early in my own website or my redo of my website, I guess, the idea of of crossing those subscriber thresholds um, and then having to pay 30 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month, more than that, just to send a newsletter probably once a month just makes me really unhappy to even contemplate. Um, So that's why I decided to go with Substack because it seems like it doesn't matter how big your subscriber base gets, they will not charge you. (laughs) Um, So it's a little bit weird because it takes you off of my site when you subscribe. But my thought is I can write short blogs on Substack that link you back to the blogs that I've written on my site. So it seems like a decent solution for the meantime. And then I guess if I ever want to change it and start paying, or if I decide that I will not get a subscriber base that warrants that, maybe I'll go with something more sophisticated that keeps me keeps users on site like MailChimp or, or something in the future. I also heard about Substack. I actually have seen uh, Kent Beck, for example, he's using it as well. So, and he's uh, someone with, all, I think, big communities around him. So, but he's posting in there. Oh, well, that's that's encouraging then <laughs> to know yeah. that people who have big followings are using it to their advantage too. Yeah, yeah. And all the cool kids have newsletters. What am I even doing with myself? It's... Apparently. <laughs> It's just like all the cool kids are starting tech podcasts. It's like there's more podcasts than there is time in the day to listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, Miroslav, is there things that we haven't covered? I know anything about testing components that we didn't get to or ask you? Oh, I think we touched the basics. And yeah, if, if we have to wrap up, it, it's just... Uh, it's very controversial uh, topic, and I think some sometimes people are too dogmatic about what we should use in terms of libraries. I think uh, at the end, it's all about um, it's all about what you really can do in your certain situation with your team, with your organiza- organizational structure, because some things may work, but others won't work in different organizations. Do you mean it's controversial in the sense that like some people give the impression that like you have to use the popular thing or else you're doing it wrong sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, for example, if you uh, do a lot of DOM comparisons in your tests and you are publicly doing that in the form of blog posts or maybe tweeting about it, you will get a lot of people commenting that uh, this is definitely in the past and you should not do that. I see. Uh, I have even uh, heard that, okay, testing if a function is called uh, by clicking something in your UI is also not a good idea. So it's some people could be really dogmatic about about uh, these things, but it it's really what works for you in this particular situation because sometimes DOM comparison m- may be required. And um, sometimes you want to test for a function call, especially if it's somewhere between conditional logic. So you should really think about, um, yeah, what works for you. Yeah, I feel like that's that's good advice for, I mean, React testing for React or just software development in general. Like it's uh, it's good to have sort of best practices, but at the same time, like, don't yell at people on Twitter for <laughs> for things that they're doing that you don't totally have the context for either. <laughs> yeah, that's why I don't have Twitter. 
also Fair probably enough. a good idea. <laughs> it takes too much of my time and I don't really have time to get into conversations and yeah, write and tweet about irrelevant. Well, cool. Paige, do you have anything else? No, this has been a really interesting conversation though. So since you're not on Twitter, if people want to find you, where can they find you online? If you just go to my blog, you will find uh, a few links. Probably the best way is by just email. And uh, I have also LinkedIn and uh, GitHub. So this is the way to do it. Well, cool. This episode is sponsored by Sentry. Sentry is the thing that I put into all of my apps first thing. I figure out how to deploy them. I get them up on the web and then I run Sentry on them. And the reason why is because I need to know what's going on in my app all the time. The other thing is, is that sometimes I miss stuff. I'll run things in development, works on my machine. We've all been there, right? And then it gets up into the cloud or up on a server and stuff happens, stuff breaks. I didn't configure it right. AWS credentials, something like that, right? And so I need to get the error reporting back. But the other thing is, and this is something that my users typically don't give me information on, is I need to know if it's performing well, right? I need to know if it's slowing down because I don't want them getting lost into the Twitterverse because my app isn't fast enough. So I put Sentry in, I get all of the information about what's going right and what's going wrong, and then I can go in and I can fix the issues right away. So if you have an app that's running slow, you have an app that's having errors, you have an app that you're just getting started with, go check it out at sentry.io slash four, that's F-O-R, sentry.io slash four slash react, and use the code react roundup, that's all one word, to get three months of their base team plan. So why don't we move on to the picks then? Paige, you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, so my pick this week is going to be a show that has been out for a while, but my husband and I have been recently re-watching it with uh, one of our friends who hasn't seen it before, and it's the Jack Reacher series on uh, Amazon Prime. And I believe that it's Tom Clancy's Jack Reacher. It's based on the books, and it is just re-watching it after having seen it you know, a year or two ago, it's still really well done. Um, it just sucks you in and we can't stop watching it. So, um, I would definitely recommend that one. If you're looking for something else to binge as we slowly start to come out of the COVID haze (laughs) of the past year (laughs) plus. So I think that that is going, actually, I'm sorry, that that is the movie with Tom Cruise. What I'm thinking of is Jack Ryan, another Tom Clancy novel. Um, please don't write in, into the show notes about that, that I got it wrong the first time. But <laughs> Jack Ryan is uh, the series. There's two seasons. It's a great watch. Um, I would definitely encourage it if you're like, if you're into the spy, espionage, CIA type of uh, shows. Okay, I definitely remember seeing the the ads for this now, so I will have yeah, to check it out. It's a good one. Cool. My pick for this week, I got a. I've been getting my bike out a little bit more. It's been nicer here in Michigan, and I got a little thing that's a just a quick and easy speedometer for it, which I kind of like. It's kind of fun to like challenge yourself to see how fast you can go without dying on Michigan roads, but it's a. Uh, did a little bit of research and found one I like, so I will drop that in the show notes. And I'll just pick biking in general. If you're not a person that likes biking, it's fun times. Miroslav, how about your picks? I think I have two. The one is uh, I recently um, found out that Eric Rasmussen, the the person behind React Final, or yeah, React Final Forum, he also starts publishing his blog posts, and so right now he has a blog. And he's one of the people who I actually learn a lot. And I think he, he has what to say. And it's it's good to if you if you really want to read something from the people behind React because he's uh, he's programming in React for quite some time. So you can you can visit his blog, paste the link. And then uh, the other one is just an article I read recently. 
from uh, Kent Dot's uh, newsletter. But the article itself, I think it's not, it's older one, it's not new. But basically, he's talking about uh, that in many situations, you don't really need a global state management solution for your application, for your React applications. And uh, that is also the case with many of applications I, ha I have done. If you really carefully think about if you can do it just with React and maybe a little bit of context, then, uh, yeah, you don't really need Redux. But the article could be controversial <laughs> as well. I will just put the link. Yeah. yeah, we've had many discussions in past episodes about that very controversial subject, which you just mentioned. But Mark Erickson, who was a guest on the podcast a little while back, did a great job of kind of explaining the difference between Redux, which holds the global state versus context, which just passes state around the application, but isn't actually in charge of holding it which made it a lot more clear to me kind of when you might need one versus the other. But I completely agree with you. We, we as engineers have way over-engineered a lot of applications to use Redux when we probably didn't really need it in the first place. Yeah, it's, it's true. Some, sometimes we inherit habits from previous applications and we tend to copy and paste the same approach. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thanks, Miroslav, for joining us. This was a lot of fun chatting with you. Thank you, too. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, again, and see you next week. Yeah, see you next time. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.